Well, welcome to your first video lecture. I uh, hope you hopefully you enjoyed the song by They Must Be Giants. I uh, really like their things, and that periodic table song is one of my favorites. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the periodic table, about how it's arranged, and about how you tell some things about various kinds of atoms from the periodic table. Some of you may have learned some of this before but I'm not sure how much each one of you knows, so we're going to spend some time talking about it to make sure everybody's on the same page. While you're watching or listening to this uh, screencast, you need to make sure that you're taking notes. You can pause, stop, rewind, replay, any part of this that you want to. Um, as, long as, you, as long as you're taking notes, make sure you get everything thoroughly down. After this on the playlist, the very next thing on the playlist is the PowerPoint itself, and so if you need to copy something down specifically from there, feel free to do that uh, once you get finished. So the periodic table as we know it was organized by Dmitry Mendeleev in the mid-1860s. Um, he and a number of other scientists had noticed some trends of properties that various elements had, things that kept repeating, and so came, he came up with the idea to arrange the elements in order of these properties. The, pro the form that we're used to seeing nowadays um, is using his model, although it looks different than the one he had, but it also helps us identify these properties and the trends of properties that occur between groups of elements. Here's what it looks like today. You probably are familiar with this already. There are a total of seven rows or periods and 18 columns or groups. Sometimes the columns are called families instead of groups. I vary back and forth between one and the other. So you might hear me refer to it as a group in one sentence and a family in the other, but they mean the same thing. But the periods are the rows. Um, the periods tell us how many energy levels are found in the atoms of each element. The um, electrons orbit around the nucleus in various energy levels. And so the rows or the periods tell us how many energy levels there are, whether there's one or three or seven. The columns or the families show us the general properties of each element. In other words, how its atoms combine with other elements, how it reacts with other elements, and so forth. Uh, they, these are things that repeat down that column that, as far as the way they combine with other elements. It's very easy to tell what's going to uh, combine with what based on where they're located in the periodic table. When you look at a box, of, of an element box on the periodic table, you see several things there. The atomic number, which is found here at the top, uh, tells us how many protons are in each atom, and that's what determines which atom it is. That usually appears either right above or right below the symbol. The mass number down at the bottom tells us how many total protons and neutrons are found in an average item, uh, average atom, rather. <coughs> um, this particular element, vanadium, has a mass number of 50.942. Now, what that means is that most of the atoms of this element have a total of 28 neutrons and 23 protons. But there are some that have 30, there are some that have 26 or 27, there might even be one that has 31. When you average them all together, you get this number with this decimal place, okay? So that's because some of these atoms have more or fewer neutrons. Those are called isotopes, an atom that has a different number of neutrons than others, and those are called various isotopes. The most common isotopes of vanadium are going to be vanadium-51, because we're going to take this number, we're going to round it. We're going to use the numerical rules of rounding to determine the normal or the average um, atomic mass. So whenever you see that decimal number, don't get blown by that. Don't think that there's part of a neutron or extra electrons have mass or something like that. It just has to do with an average, just like your grade average in school. You find the uh, number of neutrons by subtracting the number of the, the atomic number, the number of protons, from the, from the atomic mass, rounded to the nearest whole number. Make sure that you're using the regular rules of rounding that you've been using in math class for several years now. If it's 0.5 or greater, you're going to add a number to the whole number. And if it's, point, if it's less than 0.5, you're going to just ignore the decimal. The number of electrons in a neutral atom equals the number of protons. Notice I said neutral atom because sometimes atoms gain or lose electrons, which we're going to talk about in, a, in another lesson. 
the electrons are arranged in these energy levels. Um, each energy level can hold a maximum number of electrons. This particular element, xenon, has five energy levels. And so you can see on the first energy level, the one that's closest to the nucleus, has only two electrons. The second energy level has eight. The third has 18. The fourth has 18. And then the outside one here has only eight again. Here's a rule that applies to all atoms. The maximum number of electrons that can be found in the outermost energy level is never more than eight. Now, if it's, in, if it's a very small atom like hydrogen or helium that has only one energy level, there are only two electrons that can be held in that first energy level. So they have a maximum number of two in their outside energy level just because they only have one. But any element that has more than two uh, electrons is going to have three or more, uh, two or more energy levels, and they can have up to eight electrons in that outermost energy level. The number of electrons in the in that valence electron shell, that's what that's called, the valence shell, uh, tells us how atoms can combine with other atoms to make compounds. Now, if atoms had desires, okay, they would want to have a complete outer energy level. And in order to gain this, they're going to either lose electrons or gain electrons or share electrons. The number of electrons that an atom usually gains or loses is called its valence number, and it's going to be uh, uh, expressed as a positive or negative number. So if, if you can imagine, if it can have a total of eight electrons, if there are fewer, fewer than four, it's going to have a tendency to lose electrons. If there are more than four, it's going to have a tendency to gain electrons. And if there are four, it can go either direction. They can either gain or lose. And all of these are able to share electrons to accomplish that full valence shell. Okay, you can figure out an element's valence number by looking at which column or family it's found in. So when we look at the periodic table here, we said that there are 18 columns. Let's start off with this first column over here, the one that's headed by hydrogen. Now you know hydrogen is a very small atom. It has one proton, one electron. That's all there is to it. Every once in a while, you'll have an atom of hydrogen that has a proton and a neutron. Okay, that's just another um, isotope of hydrogen. Uh, but the number of protons and the number of electrons are what's important here. So we have one electron. Well, it can hold two electrons, so it could gain one. Sometimes you'll see periodic tables that'll show hydrogen both here and here uh, because it can because it can gain one also. Um, but if it loses one, and all these other ones have a second or an outer second or third or more energy level and so they have an outer one that can hold up to eight electrons. If there are um, if there's only one electron it's much easier for it to lose one electron than to gain seven. So elements in this family or this group have a tendency to lose one electron. Now if they lose one electron they're not going to be neutral anymore they're going to have one more positive charge than negative charges and so we're going to say that these have a valence of plus one, because when they lose that one electron, they're going to be positively charged, one positive charge, one more positive charge than negative charges. Second family has two electrons in its outermost energy level, so they would lose two electrons, giving them a valence number of positive two. We're going to skip over this middle section here because these elements in this middle part, the, the transition elements, sometimes behave differently, sometimes can have more than one valence number, and we're mostly concerned in biology with these two columns and these six over here. So we're going to skip the, the transition elements right now and come over here to the boron family, and these have three electrons in their outermost energy level. They can lose three more easily than they can gain five, so they have a positive three valence number. The carbon family, these have four electrons. Now they, they're in that unique position of being able to either gain or lose. Oftentimes we show their valence as plus or minus four. The nitrogen family has five electrons in the, in the outermost energy level. Now, it's much since they've got more than half, it's easier for them to gain electrons than to lose them. So in order to be a, have, a, have a full valence shell, they would need to lose, I mean, to gain three electrons, which would give them three more negative charges than positive charges, so they would have a valence of negative three. Oxygen has six electrons. They would gain two to have a negative two valence number, 
and fluorine, chlorine, bromine, the, the halogens over here, have seven electrons. They're almost full, so they really want to gain one electron and give them a minus one valence number. This family over here, this last one, helium, neon, argon, and krypton, and xenon, these are called the noble gases or the inert gases. They have complete outer energy levels, so they don't have a tendency to react at all. When I was in school, we learned we called these the inert gases, which means they did not react. And so we're going to give them a balance of zero. All right. In the middle here, in the transition elements, these vary from time to time. Uh, when you look over here, let's say for copper and silver and gold, copper usually has a plus one balance, sometimes a plus two. Silver, same thing, plus one, plus two. Cobalt can have plus three or plus four. So the, there's varying numbers in here, so we're not going to worry with those right now. We don't deal with too many compounds containing these elements that we need to worry about knowing what their valence is. So we're going to skip those, and you'll learn a lot more about those in chemistry next year. Now, when you look at the periodic table, <coughs> there's a lot of other stuff that you can learn. Of course, we have the groups or periods numbered up here. And, I mean, the groups numbered up here. The periods, again, tell us how many um, energy levels they have. Over on the right hand side you usually see a zigzag line like this. Elements to the left of this line are called metals. Elements to the right of this line are called nonmetals, and those that are touching the line are called metalloids. And they have some properties of both metals and nonmetals. Um, not all of them are considered metalloids. For instance, boron is a metalloid, but aluminum is not. And, uh, because aluminum is very definitely a metal. So, but they have some properties that are a little bit different because they combine properties of both uh, nonmetals and metals. Normally in biology, we're going to be dealing a lot more with the nonmetals over here. And they have a tendency to form certain kinds of compounds, which we'll talk about in our next part of this unit. Um, <clears throat> so we have the metals, the nonmetals, and then the metalloids here. When atoms of different elements join together, they form compounds. Generally, compounds formed from a metal and a nonmetal are called ionic compounds. An example of this is sodium chloride or salt. Sodium is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal, and that forms an ionic compound. The form, those ones that form two or, from two or more nonmetals are called covalent compounds. And we're going to talk a lot more about these compounds and how they form in the next part of the unit. So now these notes are over, make sure that you write a good summary in your notes. As you continue on through the playlist, there's a quiz at the end that you need to take. Let me know how you did on the quiz, and we'll talk about what we need to do in class tomorrow.